For anyone who doesn't know you, Monica, gay Italian Nona, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, what your pronouns are, and how you identify? Yeah, sounds good. So hello to everyone listening. Ciao. Benvenuti. Yeah, no, I can speak Italian. Mi chiamo Monica. Uh, piacere. Ooh, but uh, it's getting hot in I here. Always, I always speak a little, a little Italian and then it throws people off. It's like, ooh. But um, yes, you can call me Monica. You can call me Nonna, whichever you prefer. Um, I like to say I identify as an old soul, but I am a queer lesbian. Um, and my pronouns are she, her. Yeah. Do you remember the first moment you realized you might be queer? Like, did you have an aha moment? Um, there were, I think there were so many signs growing up and I truly, I was just very naive to like everything. I didn't, I grew up in, you know, an immigrant household. My parents came from Italy and very, they grew up very Catholic, very Roman Catholic. And there was not a lot of representation of like queerness, um, at all. So I, I feel like there were many signs looking back. But there were no aha moments until I was really in my mid 20s. Um, and that's kind of when I realized, you know, I was dating a man for five years. We were going to do the whole marriage thing. He was going to propose. And I was like, ah, panicking. So I randomly just like dumped him out of nowhere. Wow. And it confused everyone, even myself. And I, at that time, was like, I think the first date I want to go on is with like a woman. And so I went on a date with a woman and uh, in true lesbian fashion, she's my best friend. So she's literally right here in the room. <laughs> oh my <laughs> God. Hey again. Hey again. So yeah. So, so hold on. So your best yes. friend who's in your room is also the first woman you ever been on a date with. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So I, we, we met, we had a wonderful date. Um, it was great. Like we went, what, Cruise and Tango, Smiths. Yeah, it was it was a beautiful dinner. It was all of that. And then I was like, I'm totally straight. Like those were my words to her. And um, and then I went back in the closet for what, like five years. Yeah. Interesting. There was, yeah, I just I don't think I was ready. Like it yeah. it all felt too good that I was like, Yee. you know, like a I, little I was panicky. Like, maybe, like a li- yeah. very panicky very panicky. And, um, you know, there were a few extended cousins at the time that were like, Hey, are you a lesbian? And it just like really threw me off. And Mm -hmm. the timing of that just wasn't ideal. So I just panicked and pushed it down for like five more years. We kept in touch, obviously, which is my best friend. And then, you know, I would occasionally turn my Bumble and Tinder back on to just women and (laughs) <laughs> text you know text women and and whatnot and it wasn't really like an aha moment like a full aha until I would say COVID like in TikTok like I was scrolling through TikTok right. and I was like my entire feed was just queer queerness gay like all of these amazing lesbian thirst traps and I was like I think it's time to say I'm gay like <laughs> that's kind of just what went through my head so I feel like so many people went through that self-discovery during COVID because you just, you're in isolation and you're kind of like on social media. I know so many people who were like, when I was on TikTok, they were just noticing they were like feeling attractions, like outside of what they had ever thought before. So that's that's amazing. Yeah. It's like, you're stuck with your thoughts, right? Like you're truly stuck with yourself. You're stuck with your thoughts. Like Mm -hmm. you're not really distracting yourself with other things and people and I like wasn't dating. I mean, we were on lockdown, right? So, you know, I'm kind of thankful for it. So it just allowed me to be like, yes, these are attractions that I have and I'm a hundred percent gay. So thanks COVID for that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I came out as gay during COVID too. It was May of 2020. I identified as bi for many years, but something just didn't feel right with that label. But then I was like, all that reflection, purse you're gay is literally what I said. Yeah. <laughs> purse yeah. you're gay. Yeah. Oh, well, we've heard that story so many times too on the pod. Like COVID really was like a gay awakening for so many people. I also really love the part of your story and how honest you are about going back in the closet, because I think it's powerful to say like, I wasn't ready yet. And a lot of people might feel rushed to come out or rushed to explore those feelings they're having. And it's not a rush, like take your time and you'll get where you're supposed to go when you get there. Feelings are really complex. 
No, for sure. And I think it's also like a safety thing too, right? I didn't know how my family was going to react. Like I was already, you know, and I'm very thankful, like, thank God they're, they're great. But you know, at the time, if I had already had like some extended family being like, are you gay? You know, and they were joking and doing cheers and being like, Monica's not gay. That, that takes a, to- like, like, am I safe to come out? Can I, am I going to lose my family? Like, these are all thoughts that go through, you know, at least my head and I'm sure others as well, where it's like, am I really going to lose everyone if I'm just like, hey, this is what I am. And I wasn't ready at that time. And yeah, so that's why I'm a, everyone asks me like, oh, what's that one thing you, you know, what's it, one advice, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll save that for another time, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for the sure. end. Did you have kind of a coming out moment? Did you come out to your family? Did you come out to your friends? If you feel comfortable, can you share that coming up? Yes, yes, totally. I think I texted my best friend. I texted my best friends. <laughs> and so I texted Vera. I was like, I'm gay. And she was like, <laughs> she was like, I was just waiting for it. You know, um, I, I texted, you know, my, my other best friends, you know, Carol, Maria, Gloria. And I was like, Hey, I uh, think this is what it is. Um, and you know, they were just like, oh, like, we're not really surprised. Like we wish we were able to support you more from when you were questioning. Cause they were there along the journey, right? Like they all, they all knew Vero and everything. So it was, you know, texting through that. And then I'm honestly, like, I can't even remember. I feel like it's a whirlwind. Like, I think I texted my sister it also. Like, I was just like, I'm going to mass text. <laughs> and then for my parents, I called my mom and I told her. And then I told my dad in person and I was so nervous because my dad is just very, he's like the epitome of an Italian man, like, you know, Italian professor, like very, very Italian. And I said to him, like, Hey dad, so I'm gay. And his exact words were, I know. And that was the end of the conversation. And I was like, oh, okay. And my dad is like literally the biggest ally. Like I was shook it, like shook it. Yeah. So he's, he's a gem. I just, yeah, he's, he's so cute. And same with my mom and my mom cried, but like not out of like, you know, oh, my daughter is gay. It was more again, just along the lines of like, oh, I wish I was able to support you. So it was kind of like a. Like I was very, I'm very fortunate. I'm very blessed. Like that, you know, very privileged to have parents like that. But I prepared myself for the worst, truly. Like I was like, I am ready to be disowned. Um, so then, yeah, so I, I told all of them and then I started to date. And it wasn't until like, you know, I had um, a partner at the time that I decided to, you know, tell my extended family. And I just did it through a mass text message for my cousins. You're all um, about the mass text. In group. I'm about the mass text, like quick, easy, and efficient. <laughs> like easy. also, like Get it done. you know, I'm I'm an avoidant, like through and through. <laughs> so if I don't have to have a verbal, <laughs> same girl, like, same. great. Um, but I did, out of respect, call some of my cousins. Uh, sorry, my zios and zias, so like my aunts and uncles. Um, simple because I didn't want my parents go having to be the ones to be like, hey, this is this is that, like, I just know how the Italian community is. And it's just very like, they just keep talking, you know, so very chatty. Um, So I called, I called them and uh, some, you know, use the Schitt's Creek and out like they, they were like, we watch Schitt's Creek. We understand. I was like, Oh, that's great. Others um, didn't understand it. Like I did have, you know, some hang up the phone on me or some say like, let me tell your uncle or let me tell this person like it's okay but they've all come around in their own way um I think it's also like yeah that they've all so so far um there are obviously a few things that I don't see them as often right so if they I think that's the other blessing about like COVID is like I haven't fully experienced all of it yet but right I I do know that I think at the end of the day, like it's, it's about the respect in my family. So like they'll respect it, whether they want to say like, to me, if they want to say, oh, this is your friend instead of partner or whatever, as long as you're respectful of the two of us, that's what matters. Like Mm -hmm. not going to hide who I am. I don't want my partner to hide who they are. Like 
that's that's it you know it's a lot of education like a lot of conversations and and learning so Mm -hmm. yeah and that's something we talk about a lot on this podcast it's like in a perfect world everyone would be immediately accepting understanding and knowledgeable and not ignorant but yeah. that's just not the way the world is. And it's not, yeah. it's not like your responsibility to educate your family, yeah. but the fact that you have an understanding that they might take a little bit to come around is, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's sometimes it's a two way street of just having patience yeah. with each other. Yes, exactly. And my family is large. So there, are, there is like, you know, one side of the family that they were very homo, they were very homophobic. I'm not going to lie. And they straight out, you know, didn't know I was gay and then started talking stuff to my mom about it. And we all, my mom put them in their place. So I'm like, I'm very thankful for that. But it's something that is scary. It's like, you never know how people are going to reply or change. Like you think they're going to be your family for 30 odd years. And the next day they're just like, you're dead to me. Like, it's scary. It's so scary. And it's, it's, yeah. But um, I think, you know, just talking about it more and like you said, having people educate themselves, I think is the biggest piece. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's I'm thankful for my cousins to for educating their parents. That's mm-hmm. really what it comes down to as well. Like my cousins have been really great allies. So. Yeah. Yay, yeah allies. To have that support for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes to allies. Honestly. Yes to allies. Yeah. I so. have a quick question before we uh, move on. About yeah. something that you mentioned. It's a question for both of you guys, Persis and Monica. You mentioned that when you were coming out to different groups of people, uh, some of your friends, and then your mom also said something along the lines of like, I'm sorry I wasn't more there for you while you were discovering this. We talk a lot about like how straight people should react when someone comes out to them. And sometimes I feel like apologizing for not being there almost puts like, an unnecessary guilt on that person or makes that person feel like they need to make me feel okay now. Um, like, Oh no, don't worry. It's okay. Um, how do you guys feel about that? Like, I think it's a, I think that reaction is really normal and I understand what they're saying. They're like, Oh, did, was I there for you? But I'm just curious to both of your perspectives. Like, did you have, did you have anyone react that way persons? And do you sometimes feel like you need to make other people feel okay? Or like Mm -hmm. they didn't, or like they were supporting you. I feel like with my mom, she kind of said she wished maybe she was there for me more with like certain conversations. But at the same time, like even Monica, my parents were very, very yeah. accepting and being in an Indian oh, family too. I mean, my extended family is like another story, some yeah. of them, but my parents were great. So even when my mom had said like, she wished she like knew or was there, I I remember just saying like, but I didn't even really know myself. Like throughout that discovery, I wasn't like coming to them being so assured. There were many moments where I said, like, I think I could like this girl. Um, but yeah, I I haven't really had that experience personally, but I see what you mean where it's like, do I have to reassure that party? Because, But I don't think like you really have to, like there's really nothing to apologize for in that sense if you didn't know. I like what I said to them was like, hell, fuck, I did wish I knew. Like <laughs> if you didn't know, like I didn't even know, you know, so I, I didn't feel the need that to like, that I had to like, you know, reassure them or ever. I think it was kind to hear like that they would have the support or be able to, you know, maybe push me through that journey, but I had to go through it myself. Right. So like, if they were like, oh, we wish we, you know, we asked you more questions so you could realize like, even if they did, that it's my own thought process. It's my own journey. Right. Like they can't really help me like speed it up. So I actually didn't mind. I kind of liked, I liked how their response was versus them. Like what bugs me is like my dad aside was like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like I could have told you that when it's a straight person, <laughs> it's a straight person. Like, mm, could you? But yeah, I think that bugs me more. But even then, like, as long as you're accepting and you're happy, that's what makes me happy. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. I love yeah. that for answering that you guys. Yeah. And I, I'm so glad to hear your parents were accepting them. That's lovely to hear. It's it's nice to hear those stories too, right? Yes. Um, I always love like promoting that as well because like uh, it gives people hope too. So yes, that's literally, I had this conversation with my parents today about it. And I was like, you need to give advice about like 
you know, to, I, I managed to get them in a TikTok and I'm going to post it like later this week. And, um, you know, I said to them after, I'm like, this gives people hope. Like you don't realize the impact of you speaking about this. Like my mom's just like, I'm, you know, just tiny little old Italian woman. I'm like, no, you are giving people hope, like truly, because if they can see, you know, a 65 year old, a 68 year old Italian immigrant being and acting the way that they are, when they go to church every Sunday, they say the rosary seven times a day, it gives people hope. Yeah. So I, 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 you know, I like to scream it too, because it's, it's important. It's that, you know, hope, hope exactly. is what, hope is hope. what makes you happy. Keeps you alive. Keeps you alive. Absolutely. Yeah. But um, tell us about creating gal, gal, oh my gosh, gay Italian Nona. Um, yeah. What inspired the account and how did it gain traction on TikTok? Yeah. So um, I guess I'll start with like what, what inspired gay Italian Nona first before the, the TikTok, but my grandma's like my idol and she like rest in peace, but she was truly an amazing woman. She cared about the community that she was involved with, the Italian, the church. She was just a, such a loving soul. So I say that I'm just like, you know, I'm, I'm living what she would want for me. And, and so that's why I call myself Nana, aside from the fact that I literally wear like Birkenstocks to the club and want to be in bed by 11. Like I truly am like, yeah, so you're laughing. Like I literally am a old soul. Like I am <laughs> old soul through and through we'll cook you dinner. It makes me happy. So that's kind of where the gay Italian nonna comes in. Like just making, you know, when I think of a nonna, it's like the heart of the family, right? It's the, someone that brings people together. It's someone that makes the, them feel great about themselves, that encourages people, that is very loving. And like, it's almost like an unconditional love, like no matter who you are, what you're doing, like how you identify, like, you know, there's love. So that's kind of, I, I, that's my inspiration for, for Nana. Um, but yeah, it's, it's cute. So I say it's an honor of her. Um, but with TikTok, I honestly, I was a burner account for like ever. And I actually went by another handle and it was like Toronto dog mom. And I was just a creeper on TikTok, like liking all the lesbian straps. And my friends growing up always said like, Monica, you need to get on YouTube. You need to go on social media. You need to do TikTok. And I was like, no, like, I don't have energy for this. Like, no, like, again, there's the grandma in me. And, and so one day I've gotten to neighbor wars. I got into a, a literal neighbor wars with my upstairs neighbor. And I decided to make a TikTok about it and it blew up. <laughs> and so I made a series about this neighbor wars, um, about this, like, horrible person that lived above me and like I would just like one of the videos was like raiding the garbage that my neighbor dumps on my balcony like it was just like they so... were actually doing that oh yeah they were horrible they would like see me clean in my balcony and then they would dump water <laughs> on top of it and it was like all this like soapy grimy water and like throw their like <laughs> oh they were and like all That's of us so neighbors were one day yeah it was horrible we were all like saying like hey do you mind not doing that like just throw it down the toilet and he literally told us to like, can I swear on this podcast? Yeah. Oh yeah. He literally was like, go fuck yourselves. And so I said, fuck you. I'm making a TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I did. And anyways, she left the building and now I have lesbian neighbors and like karma has come around. <laughs> so it's, yeah. So that's how I started. So like, next thing you know, I'm like 10 K in because of this neighbor wars. And I was like, I just should start using this platform for good and like, you know, for community. And I was newly out. So I was like, let me just be, you know, I wish I had, you know, some Italian representation growing up of what it, what it, someone queer was, right? The only person I saw on television was Ellen. Mm -hmm. I related nothing to Ellen. So I was like, let me just speak about this. Let me speak about my experiences. And if it helps one person, amazing and that's all that matters so that's kind of um what happened and then it just kind of like you know took off and I heard a lot of people say like I wish I had a queer community I wish I had queer friends and you know I'm I'm thankful that literally my best friend is someone that I met years ago 
that's in the community and she's been so welcoming and thanks. So thank you. But it's hard. It's hard to make queer friends. Like it truly is. So I was like, let's host snakes and lattes and let's make an Italian dinner. So that's kind of where, you know, I want to, to hopefully make some change into people's lives. So it all started with a, a silly TikTok about my neighbor. That's and little amazing. Did he know. Yeah. Little did he know. Uh, little did he know that <laughs> would be the inspiration for like, what is Gay Italian Nonna? Yes. <laughs> gay Italian Nonna is the old lady on the lawn screaming at you. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that is <laughs> literally what I was. It's but yeah, it's to him. Pardon? Like, Fuck you. I'm going to make a successful TikTok yeah. account. 100%. And like the best part is like my like building management knew all about it and was like loving it so much. And I, and yeah, so it's, 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 it's been a, it's been a ride. It's been a, it's been a ride. That's all I have to say. We have to watch that series later, Purse. I don't think I've seen it yet. Me neither. I'm going to go creep. Is it still like yeah. on this account? Like, is it? Still- oh, it's like, it's, oh yeah. So it's the very, like very first video. I think Amazing. honestly, maybe the first video is like my dog attacking a blueberry. Like it's just, stu- like it doesn't make sense. The TikToks, like it really doesn't, but yeah. And then you'll see the transition of like neighbor wars to gay, 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 gay. <laughs> yes, amazing. <laughs> like, gay. Yeah. And like, look at the, like, I feel Toronto has actually like gotten such a good queer community now, like post COVID and now like the events, yeah. there's just so much happening. At least that's there's what tons. I've noticed since. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a lot of, a lot of people, you know, just amplifying each other's voices, amplifying these other events that are happening. And I, I feel like it's, you know, a, I don't know what it was prior to COVID, but I feel like, you know, we have like a, we just have like a, the biggest woman loving woman party at Candyland. Like that was massive. That was 2000 women and non-binary folks. So it was wow. busy. It was, wow. mass. it was busy. It was busy. And so, you ran yeah. into everyone, Did everyone, everyone, hundred <laughs> percent. Like it was all night. It was just like a, Hey, 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 Hey. Like, yeah. Yeah. Honestly, persons can attest to what it was like before COVID and so much of what you just said, Monica, about like what inspired you to make the account more gay focused. It reminds me of Persis, like Persis didn't see any Indian gay femme girls growing up around her. All she saw was Ellen. And then also you were struggling so much to find other women loving women in Toronto and your community, like you you were really to find your community in Toronto. It was tough out there. COVID really Mm -hmm. changed. It did, yeah. honestly. Well, it had a silver lining, and it's the gays. <laughs> the gays. <laughs> it's the I should gays. put that on a co. I should oh make God. that merch. Covers so- <laughs> the gays. It's so true, though. Yes. Right? I would buy that. I would fully buy that. Please make yeah. that. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. New merch. New merch. New merch dropping soon. Please. <laughs> okay, so you are newly out. You're a baby gay. You're posting publicly for the world to see about yeah your sexuality your experience and that's a pretty vulnerable place to be a lot of people might not be brave enough to do that what is your what was that experience like being vulnerable online especially as someone who has just come out like how you navigated talking so much sexuality yeah it's funny because like I I get I get this question a lot, like in person, like, how did you go from like literally coming out to just organizing crazy events? And, um, I think for me, uh, at least online is I truly don't give a fuck. Like I don't care if I make myself look stupid. If I make myself look silly, I don't give a shit. If it makes someone happy, if it makes someone be like, Oh, that could like, that could be me. I could be out and Italian and gay and living my life. I am happy. So like for me, I lived so much of my life in the closet. I lived so much of my life for other people that I'm doing it for me now. So really like that's, that's kind of how it is. And it's, it's just like, if I want to make a TikTok of me doing a thirst trap, then I'm going to, I'm going to do a thirst trap and own it. And I'm in myself and I'm in my feelings. And I truly am at a point in my life where I'm just done pleasing other people's expectation of how I should be living. Truly. Mm -hmm. Like I just want to live my life for me. And if I'm able to do that online and inspire people, 
fantastic. If, you know, I think a lot of my journey, a lot of people have seen my journey. Like it's literally all up there. Like my journey of like when, and when I first, cause technically I did come out as pansexual when I was still processing. Right. And then it, I think I, I forgot to mention that part, but it was that. And then it was, you know, after my partner was like, no, it, you know, le- lesbian and it, people saw that journey and people saw the journey of like, you know, how I'm dressing and how I'm feeling of myself. And it's a constant journey. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, it's just really embracing who I am and loving who I am in just a very public form. I think, you know, the hard part for me is navigating maybe like more personal relationships or dating online. Like I do want to talk about it, but I also want to protect it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, I think the hardest part for me when it comes to, you know, dating, um, and how do I put that online? Like that, I get that question all the time. Are you single? Are you dating? Are you this? And I'm like, I am just existing. And when I am ready, I will share it. Like that's it. Um, and, but when it comes to my sexuality, I'm going to scream it from the rooftops. Like truly I have nothing to hide. Like I hid in the closet. Like I'm, I'm done with that. Goodbye. So yeah. 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 I love (laughs) that so much. Have you always had this kind of confidence? Like even when you were in the closet, did you have kind of like a, I don't give a fuck energy. Was that always part of you? Or do you feel like coming out has made you really embrace that part? Like, I wish you could see my friend right now. She's like, she's like, mm-mm, mm-mm. <laughs> so no, I, I would say I was like always very outgoing and bubbly, but I was not living. Like it was very evident that I was like not living myself, like my life for myself. Like I, I had eating disorders. I had, you know, I had tons of anxiety. I felt like I had to look a certain way. I had to achieve certain things to make you know, I think that a lot of it, and I haven't really spoken about this yet is like the first, I I don't even know the term, but it's like the generational pressure of being like a first generation Canadian. You know, my parents came from a different country to make a life better for me. And then I feel the need to be like, I'm so successful for them and I'm doing this and I'm climbing the corporate ladder and I am getting a a boyfriend and I am having children to make them happy. And that's how I lived my life for so long. And it was very evident that I wasn't happy. Like I was miserable. I honestly, I was a cranky cranky old woman for like a lot of like, yeah, a lot of my life I was just cranky. Like I was either cranky because I was on a diet or I was cranky because I didn't want to live the life that I was living. So I definitely did not have this confidence and I would say really evolved after finding myself truly. And now I don't, I, now, I, now it's here. I still have moments. Don't get me wrong that I'm like, Ooh, you know, you're just so like you yeah. now, you know, it's like, yeah, you're the most you, you, you've probably felt right. Like, yes, yes. The most me I've, I've felt. Yeah. That a lot of therapy too. Therapy helps, you know? So Amen. <laughs> Amen to therapy. We love Judy. Yeah. Judy's my therapist. I'll Wait, let her know that she was so shouted out. Judy. Shout out to Judy. <laughs> I'm going to send her in and be like, here you go, Judy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, also, this is a good segue because we wanted to ask you a little bit about being a first gen queer person because yeah. it's a unique experience. Person- yeah experience that you share with Monica as well Uh, but like you said your parents did immigrate from Italy um and there were clearly some challenges that you faced and that's not saying anything about your parents or how they raised you but just you know the the reality of being a first generation person and then coming out so what challenges do you think you faced and then what like skills have you gained from that experience yeah I I love this question because it's something I've really wanted to to speak more about but you know, I think, you know, my parents, yes, they came from Italy and they wanted us to have good lives and they want us to, you know, be successful. And it's like almost like a pride thing where it's like people call and they're like, what's Monica doing nowadays? You know, and it's like that sense of like, oh, she's doing this and this, you know, and it was really hard for me because all of my cousins got married to their first boyfriends or maybe seconds. 
Um, you know, they were all married early twenties. They all had children. They all had their house that, you know, that, you know, they, it was like the Italian dream. You get married, you do all of this, you do all of that. And you don't move out of the house until you're married. And I was, I think probably the first person in my, you know, close extended, I will say close extended family to dump my boyfriend out of nowhere. Uh, it confused everyone. And, but that was a shocker because truly everyone married there. Like, you know, he was a part of it. Our families loved each other. And I was just like, mm-hmm. there's nothing I, that gives me more anxiety than wanting to be with this person for the rest, <laughs> which is, but I did care for him. And I did love him. Right. I was of course. Very, and to me, I never wanted that, that, that dream of like having babies, having marriage, all of that. Like it, never was my story. Right. And so I felt odd, but I, I, I dumped him. And then I was the first person in my cousins to move out of the house. Mm. Um, and that was tough for my parents. They were just like, Oh, my, my sister got married and then moved out. Oh my cousins, they got married. Then they moved out. And I was like, nah, I am getting my own place and I'm being an own in my own individual. And I'm going to do that. And I got ta- like, I've like tattoos and piercings and I was like I'm gonna go travel the world and so I did ask though like that courage (laughs) too like (laughs) hello yeah but but I felt like you know that little outcast like I was always like the wild one or like oh like you know and they would always be like look at you living your life and having fun and all of that and would always come back like when are you gonna like settle down and when are you gonna do this and you know I, I think that was really like it, it took a lot. Like it was, it was constantly like, Hey parents, I'm going to get a tattoo. Hey, I'm going to travel. Hey, I'm this, Hey, I'm gay. Like there, it was just like, you know, one thing after the other. And I make a joke that I'm like the golden trifecta for my parents. Cause I'm Italian celiac. So I can't have gluten. I have tattoos and I'm gay. So it's like <laughs> all three things. It's just like, you know, and that celiac is part of that. (laughs) Oh, I'm serious. The trifecta, the trifecta. And, you know, I think with them, I I have severe guilt issues. I'm a people pleaser. We're working on it. I'm therapy, you know, I'm going to call Judy up and talk to her about it. But like, Uh for me, it's like, I, my parents version of what the like Canadian American dream is, is a very different reality than what my dream is. Mm -hmm. And I like to think of it that like, they decided to pick up and move to another country to get a life that yes, is better for them and their children. So when I think of it, why can't I do something that is very different than their generations did to make my life better and other, you know, if I do decide to reproduce probably not but like my fur baby's life's better you know Mm -hmm. so that's kind of the the biggest struggle and I think this the strength I think you asked what strength it is is the resilience and the determination like I saw my parents work their fucking asses off like they came here and you know they they didn't have much and they worked and they didn't stop to be able to provide, you know, a, a life for my, me and my sister. And they also were able to show me like a strong sense of family and like power and family and power together. So I think that to me is like the strength and I thank them for it. Cause it's like, whether it's with them or my chosen family or my partner, like it, or the community, we're stronger together. Right. And you're going to get knocked down, but you'll get up and it's that resilience and determination. Like it's a strong work ethic um, that I'm just very grateful that I was able to see them them work very hard. So yeah, very grateful for them. They're good people. Yeah, that's beautiful. I really love that mindset shift of like, if they were able to break the mold, then who, who's to say yes. I can break the mold? A hundred percent. And my cousins are all living their lives and like doing all, you know, and I'm like, okay, cool. Like, you know, whether yeah. it was because of me or not, does it not matter? It's like the fact that, you know, we're now able to do that. And um, yeah, so it's nice just seeing people like live their, live their lives for them. 
Mm -hmm. For them. Exactly. For them. Yeah. It's so true. You really hear like the saying, like people like live for their parents or like to make other people happy. That's very yes. common. Yeah. It's, and I think it, especially in like a, an, an immigrant household, like, and even in general, it doesn't have to be immigrant, but like you almost have that guilt of like, they changed everything and they came here and nothing. And, oh my gosh. and I don't yeah. know, like, I don't know if you've experienced that or stay with your parents. It's like, I can't, they would tell us stories. Like I came here with nothing and we had to work and, you know, back in the old country, we, we didn't have, and it's like, it gets, it gets to you. It gets to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was actually having um, a conversation with my cousin like two nights ago, he came over for dinner and he was saying he's, he was feeling guilt for many years um, with my aunt, like his mom, he was thinking like, I just want to make her happy. Like my parents came all this way, literally yes. immigrated yes. from India. Yeah. And he recently um, came out as pan. So yeah. Okay. Well, nice. congratulations to your cousin. Yeah. But yeah. it's that, it's that guilt. It's like guilt, but yeah, the ther yeah. therapy, therapy. Yeah, it's therapy. It's mindset shifts. Like I think, yeah. I think that it's such great advice. And anyone who's listening who is a first gen queer person, yeah. I think really shifting that mindset is so key. Yeah. I think it's also great that you're there to be like a support system for them too, right? Yeah. Like, you know, it, and that goes back to like powers and numbers. Like when you. You, you can band together, you can talk to each other. Like, it's almost like, oh, I saw them do it. I saw her do it. I saw him do it. I saw them do it. Like, let me go talk to them. And, and that's, you know, that's a beautiful thing that, you know, they have you to, as support and they have friends as well, like that, that community sense. So. Exactly. Yeah. Community is so important. Like, cannot yeah. stress that enough. Um, We really want to talk about your style because your style is great and yeah <laughs> you're like yes, thank you <laughs> thanks <laughs> and um it's also actually a big part of your content so yeah. how does fashion help you express your sexuality and individuality oh yeah um fashion for me I used to hate it I used to have a love-hate relationship with it like I was always like I would say fashionable um you know, when I was in the closet, when I identified as straight, it, I studied hair and makeup, like it, it, that was kind of me. Right. But I, deep down inside, even if I looked confident on the outside, it was how I felt on the inside that I think no one saw. And I truly hated it. I, I hated how I felt in some of these clothes. I hated, you know, not being able to really dress for me. Um, and so now that I truly don't give a fuck, I'm dressing like, that's my saying, I don't give a fuck. Like, that's it. I'm dressing for me now. And it's taken a while to get to the style, um, that I kind of like, and I, it, it goes through, you know, waves and it's still going to be like a, a journey. But for me, it's, I wake up and I'm like, what do I want to wear? I get excited. It's like, how do I feel today? Do I want to feel like you know, a femme goddess? Do I want to feel like a dom daddy? Do I want to feel like a grandpa? Do I want to feel like a grandma? Like, it's really like, what kind of nunna are you going to get today? And like, it keeps it exciting for me, like truly. Um, and I think it, it, it's a really great way to express yourself, right? Like, and I think that the whole clothes don't have gender, clothes don't have gender. You can wear whatever the fuck you want. Truly, if I want to wear Birkenstocks to the club, I am going to wear Birkenstocks to the club. Mm -hmm. And that is my aesthetic. Yes. Like it, it truly it. So it really helps me. Um, it just helps me identify with like who I am feeling that day. How am I feeling overall? Like, you know, it, it just makes me feel more confident and it makes me excited and wanting to, to be like, to go shopping. Like I used to hate shopping. Like Vero knows it. Like I would call her and be like, please take me shopping. I can't stand it. And now I actually really look forward to shopping. Yeah. So, and it's yeah, because I was really do so good. Sorry. The hauls you do are so good. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I think it's just more so like I related my experience to how I hated shopping prior to like, I, it, it's just the experience, right? Like, it's kind of just like, Oh, I don't want to go. Cause anytime I went, I never felt comfortable. I never wanted to do this. I hated how it looked all of these things. 
And now it's just like, oh, like if I want to shop for the men's section, I can. And that's okay. Hell, like if I want to shop, I don't fit into like, you know, like I fit into children's shoes, which is great. And you save money. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, yeah you can too. get the exact same shoe. Like this is like, this is like a shopping hack. You can get, if you have small feet, I have small feet and small hands. So you can get children's shoes for half the price. Exact yeah. same. Thing. It's How game small, changer. Small game changer. Um, I'm a size seven. Oh, that wasn't as small as I thought you were going to say. No, no, but I do have small hands. Like they're very small. (laughs) (laughs) They're baby hands. They're tiny. They're so little. Yeah, they're (laughs) they're very tiny. I'll just send you pictures of my tiny hands. No, you should start an OnlyFans, but specifically for tiny hands. hands. Listen, I think I think about this all day. There is a niche for everything out there. Okay, (laughs) so. Yeah. So th- I think for style, for me, it's just like, you know, embracing it, but it, it's also like something that I, I think for me, it's with my masculine and feminine, I truly don't know how I'm going to feel that day. So I could have an outfit picked out and it could be the best outfit. And I could wake up and be like, energetically, this does not match me today. And I don't know how to describe this to people other than saying, and energetically, my clothes don't match me. Mm -hmm. So I always like to keep a few options, but that's what excites me because it's like, I can match my outfit based on how I feel. So versus before it was like, that's the outfit you have to wear. Like, you know, yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit more, that dom and femme side, because you talk about this quite a bit in your content. I feel like it's almost been like part of that journey that your followers have been watching. It's like you exploring the dom side and the femme side in your fashion, but also kind of just like in your gender identity and how you show yeah. up. So can you tell yeah. us about navigating that journey between dom and femme and like yeah. show up in both is like so badass. Yeah. Thanks. I think I'm going to start with, I'm still on that journey. I'm still discovering it. I'm doing what I can to educate myself a little bit more in terms of like, what does this mean, you know, on a personal level? So I, um, I highly recommend, you know, that there's uh, a friend of mine, um, Crystal, and they run Diversity Ed Sarnia. And I've been meaning to chat with them. We just haven't had, you know, a chance, but, you know, just, oh, just talking to them and educating myself, like, it helps because, you know, just like, you know, Persis was saying with a cousin, like go having someone that's went through it, like you want to talk to them and you want to, you know, learn. So I am on that journey. So if you ask me this in like two months, it might change. But for me, it's just growing up, I always had very dominant energy, I find. So, you know, I didn't really, I, d- I did date men, but I was often told oh, you need to let them be the masculine one. You need to let them be the dominant one. You know, you need to, you need, you need to not do that. And I'm like, but, but why? Like, that's me, right? So for me, it's, I have a very strong dominant energy to me. And it just sometimes never matched, it never really matched what I was wearing, right? So there are days where I do feel more feminine, but I still want to dress like, a, like not, in like a skin tight dress. Right. So it's really finding, and I don't know if this answer is even going to make sense truly, but it's just, I'm learning so much about me. And the only way I can describe it is based on energy. If I wake up and I'm like, I am a dom, a dom daddy that day or a grandpa, like I dress accordingly. Right. So like today I'm a little, I don't know if you can see, I'm like, in a little bodysuit and I don't, I have like, you know, bra, so like the tips are free. And I, and, but then I have a dad shirt on and then I'm wearing Burks, which are very, like, it's kind of like a, a hybrid mix. And I yeah. think, you know, on a fashion scale, like people would probably be like, you should never mix those two together. And I'm just like, why not? Why not? And I, it works for me. So yeah, that's, that's it. Like my, my rules of fashion is there is no rules of fashion. There are no rules. And no. like you said, we're all energy. So everything you said makes sense. Like it makes okay, sense good. that you're going to feel like a certain way. Dom yeah. daddy, super femme, like whatever. It is. <laughs> I yeah. That. I, I get it. 
Yeah. Yeah. It totally translates to what you're putting on your body for sure. Exactly. Yeah. It, it does. It does translate. And I, I love that you said we're all energy because we are, we're all energy and we're mm-hmm. all vibrations and all of that. But yeah. So right now I would say I'm in my grandpa phase. I'm in my, oh, like grandpa. my nono energy. Yeah. Yes. I'm kind of going in a little bit into the nono right now, but um, oh. my friends were saying that I should just call, they were calling me nono all throughout pride mm-hmm. month. Cause they're just like, Oh, it's nono's here. I'm like, yep. Yes, I am. <laughs> so yeah, no, it's, it's a journey, but it's fun. And I think that's, that's like the thing with it is I'm having fun. That's all that matters. Mm-hmm. I, all that matters. When you, so you said like you wake up and you, you feel energetically, whatever that day you feel, yeah. like. do you have anything you do in the morning to kind of like figure out what that energy is, or is it an innate feeling that you've developed as you've been exploring yourself? Like, do you have a meditation you do in the morning where you're like, yeah. okay, today I'm Nona? Uh, that's a great question. I feel like I need to be more like now that I'm, I, let me think, like, what do I do? I think for me, it's when I, sometimes I, I wake up and I know if I'm like having a very like intense day, I'm like, yes, like I need to like buckle up and it's that energy. But for the most part, it's when I'm putting on clothes. So it's almost like, I don't, it's not, a body dysmorph. I, I don't know, maybe it, I'm, I'm still learning. Maybe it is, but there's days where I put on clothes. I see my tits and I'm just like, no, mm. like, no, ab- absolutely not. Like I can't. And then there's other days where I'll put on an outfit and I'm just like, no, I want to show them like they're out and about and I want to rock them out. And, and so I change my outfit. So for me, I think it's actually when I put on clothes and I see how the clothes match my feeling in that sense. I don't know if that is making sense in any, any, in any way, but I think, yes, days, there's days where I want my boobs to not be there and like flat as possible. Mm. But then there's other days where I really love, like I surprised everyone on Sunday on pride because I like my titties were out like fully. And I wore a push up run. These are like, these are like, I think they're like double D's and like, I wore a push up bra and I was like, "Mm -mm." but then there's, you know, if you literally went two days prior, I would like, we take my tits. So it really is based on how I am feeling that day. So I don't know if that (laughs) that that makes sense. And that's really cool. It's about, it's not about like, making yourself fit the clothes it's about making the clothes fit you yeah like you're it, it like you're not at liberty of what the clothes want like you decide mm-hmm. yeah yeah exactly so you know I'll, I'll tweak it so maybe instead of a bodysuit I'll wear a baggy shirt uh, yeah. And then same yeah it's just it's fun but I have fun with it but there are you know I say there's fun but there are moments of like I want to throw something like <laughs> window where I get really frustrated and I'm just like, Ooh, like, like I nothing get, is working. Get. Like I've been there too. Yes, yeah. Yes. Yes. So yeah, it's tough, but it's good. It's fun. Really love this about your content, but you're open about having social anxiety and ADHD. Um, what are the core pillars of your mental health ca- health care right now? Yeah. Um, my core pillar is Judy. Judy is my- <laughs> another shout out. Uh, so we, we love, we love Judy. Uh, I think it's a great question because, you know, back in the day, mental health was never talked about. It was stigmatized. Right. So I think for me, there's a few things that I do in terms of like resetting myself, I'll say. So I, I do a lot of like solo decompression time. So I am an introvert at core, which sounds wild, but I am also an extrovert. I'm kind of 50, 50. And for me, when I'm at an event hosting or I'm, I'm seeing an event or, you know, I'm doing a podcast, like to me, there's like a brain switch, right. That allows me to be more in that public speaker view. Right. But it's, if I were just to show up, you know, alone at a party, I'm like, I'm very shy. Like I'm like, you know, and And I get, I'm learning that it's a lot to do with like my ADHD and I get like overstimulated and there's like a sensory overload where I just need to decompress alone and in silence. Um, So what I do after an event is 
I have like a ritual and I need to stick to my ritual, but I come home and I strip all of my clothes, immediately my jewelry. Um, I strip all of it. I take a very, you know, either hot or cold shower, depending on the temperature outside. And I put on sensory safe clothes, which is probably to me, it's not fashionable in any sense. It's like, boxers maybe that but they're like the loose kinds you know so shorts very baggy sweater no bra fuzzy socks sometimes and like I just take the time to decompress I have like um what are they called the earplugs and I do that and I just kind of like decompress and kind of like you know shake it off I do a lot I just started meditating and journaling and that helps me quite a bit um and then I think a big thing for me is like quality time. So that's my love language is quality time. So whether it's, you know, with my friend or a loved one or yeah, like it's just, you know, taking that time for me is so important because if I don't, it's, it's hard. Like it is really, really, really hard. And I'm big on routine. I need routine in my life. So if I don't have routine, then that's kind of when things like you know, spiral. And I just have like, I got a journal and I write not a journal, but I have an agenda and that helps me keep things on track. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not big on medication, but, uh, I did start like, you know, ADHD meds. I'm not great at taking them because of the ADHD. I literally forget. So, um, I need to start getting better at that. So like, I don't know if there's people listening to this podcast, there are people listening. I know people are listening to this podcast. So (laughs) If there is a way for people to comment any tips or tricks, send them my way, yes. send them my way. Cause I think that's honestly, like, I just need to get better at like, how do I create routine when life is so busy and, um, but just taking the time for yourself. And I think I'm going on a tangent, but you know, for me and social anxiety and like being in public settings, a lot of people don't know this, but like, I actually have code words with my friends. So I say this to my friends, I say my code word and they know like, Oh, like she's feeling probably a little anxious right now. And they'll give me like, I hate physical touch. I do except for people that are very close to me. Mm -hmm. So they'll give me like a decompression hug or they'll just sit beside me. And like, sometimes like I look like I'm an antisocial person that doesn't want to talk to anyone. But like, if you ever like people listening to this podcast, if you ever see me at, you know, an event and I'm just sitting in a corner, I'm just taking my time Mm -hmm. and then I'll come back. It's like recharging my battery. Um, So I think, yeah, but doing that is so important and just having, you know, friends that support you in that sense and understand where your mental health is makes, makes a difference for sure that idea of the code words and I start doing that that's really good yeah the code words are great so it's like if I'm feeling very overwhelmed I'll just say the code word and then they know or I'll just straight out tell them like I need air or I need like a hug and they give me a hug um I'm also like I I'm I'm not here to promote you know drugs or anything but I do smoke you know weed and I find that does help me so often I'll be like I need a little a little puff just to kind of calm it down, but, sure. um, but I'm not promoting, you know, do what works best for you. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. that works for me. That's amazing. Like, I honestly think we should use those tools. We have all these tools that are disposable in Canada, like use them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, quick question before we move on. You said sensory clothing. Is that what you said when you were talking about the cozies you put on? Yeah. Sensory safe clothing. So like Often clothing after a while, and I'm, I'm learning, it's like, you know, maybe it's a, it's an ADHD and it's a neurodivergent thing that there after a while clothing becomes almost painful. So a lot of the times I will wear rings and then they become painful for me. And so I will take it off and I'll give it to my friend to wear, or I'll put it down and then lose it. Like that's why I'm the worst, like jewelry on my hands. Cause it becomes painful. Um, and like, there is just nothing. It almost feels like a weight sometimes the clothes. So putting on like my safe clothing is the best because it just feels like a cloud. I don't know if that, that makes sense, but sometimes For it's sure. like the oldest, rattiest, baggy t-shirt 
but there's, it's comforting. I think so. like a lot of us have those, like um, the comfort clothes. Yeah. That you put on all the time and you're like, I just love yes. it. Oh, yes. the best. it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't irritate you. The material won't like scratch at you. It's, it's just comfort. So yeah. Sensory safe. I think everyone listening can relate to that. Everyone listening has that one ratty big t-shirt that just like, oh, feels <laughs> Uh, yes that's your sensory safe quote <laughs> oh, okay that's a new term thank you for explaining that I'm learning so much um, yeah it, it's great I follow like um there's a few tech talkers that I follow like just to learn more about and I'll, I can't think of them on the top of my head like one of them is named Lisa but I can't remember the handle but if I'm like oh I'm learning I'm learning and, yeah and therapy and Judy and all of that so Judy Judy. <laughs> it should be like podcast with gay Italian Anna and Judy and Judy <laughs> and Vera. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I <laughs> love it. What advice do you have for people who are thinking of coming out or are in the process? It's a good question. So, I think the first thing is just to make sure you're safe. Like, are you in a safe space? Is it safe to come out? Um, that's like the most important thing. Um, and to have, you know, support around you, whether that's, you know, one friend or one family member or, you know, a group of friends that you feel comfortable and safe with, right? I think that to me is kind of what helped me. And I would hope that that would help someone, someone else. That's kind of my advice is the first thing is to feel safe. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel safe. And I went back, well, I, I went back in the closet. Right. And safety doesn't necessarily, it, it can come in a variety. There are, you know, people that their lives will be at risk if they come out. Um, there's others where they might lose their entire family and that's a safety thing. Right. So I think it's just ensuring that you are safe um, and surrounding yourself with, um, you know, people that love you is extremely important, unconditional love. Um, and, you know, that is your chosen family, truly. So surrounding yourself with your chosen family. And then also just like, you know, education and resource groups, I find are very helpful and um going to those resource groups, because maybe you truly do not know anyone and that resource group can help you with that. Right. So I think, you know, education um, for yourself is, is super important and what is around you that could be beneficial. Yeah. That's but it's advice. also just like, be kind to yourself. Like that's mm -hmm. the other, that's the other thing I say is like, be kind. It's going to be a journey. There's going to be ups. There's going to be downs. There's going to be frustrations. There's going to be tears. There's going to be excitement. And like, just be kind to yourself and know that like, you know, you're, they're, they're not alone in that journey and, um, and you're doing something for you. So be kind, be very kind. We're very hard on ourselves. I find. Yes. So. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Our harshest critics. Honestly. Really? Yeah. Okay. Monica, thank you so much for hanging out <laughs> with us. We are so grateful for your time. We're so grateful for your honesty, your vulnerability. It really is like these stories that we share on this podcast, even if it helps one person listening, like that is such a huge impact that you're making and through all the content you're creating. So thank you for everything you do with Gay Italian and Nona. We're big fans. And is there anything before we say goodbye that you want to plug? Anything exciting coming up? Any events? Any projects? Um, well, first off, thank you. Thank you both for having me and just also creating a very safe space for me because podcasts, you know, new for Nana. Um, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, and I would say I am, I always say I'm taking a break from things and it's it like just slowing down after pride. Um, there is going to be something coming up in the future, specifically around um, plus size bodies around physical care. So it's around big bodies need big love and it will be a partnership um, with an upcoming, you know, studio and um, how you can care and stretch and, and do that for your body within the plus time realm. Because sometimes it can be intimidating going into, um, you know, health spaces or like workout spaces. So mm -hmm. um, that more, more to come. I can't say much, but stay tuned. Um, and then honestly, yeah, people can just... Follow me on TikTok and IG. It's Gay Italian Nana. I'm always, I'm always sharing out things and 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 
you know, being my true self <laughs> online there. So we love that. anything that you need is, is, um, through TikTok and IG. Amazing. And thank you for like being that representation too. You know, we always talk about queer media rep, like literally every episode of this podcast and we want more. And yeah, it's just great that you're also a part of that, creating such a community. We need it. Thank you. And thanks for giving me a platform to do that. I'll scream from the rooftop. So I appreciate you of course. inviting me and, 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 uh, and having me. So thank you. Grazie. 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 <laughs> Oh man, we need to go to Italy. Good. Honestly, I should do like a giant queer Italian trip. That would be <gasps> the best thing. And like just queer and at queer and allies. Terry, you just like hundred <laughs> percent queer and allies. Yes. That'd be amazing. Let us know whenever yeah. that you're booking my ticket. Sky I feel like good. I feel like I'm the type of person that it's like, okay, now that's on my to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's so really cool. We're going to be hitting you up. So that, that trip yeah. you were talking about. Yeah, that? right. <laughs> we don't forget. 